はい、えー、それではですね、えー、もうあの。Then, so it's time, so let's start the first session today. So, animism、uh, perceived from anthropology and animism. And this session is about uh, uh, we have a moderator. Uh, uh, the co founder of、uh, Ecological Mean,、uh, Mr. Tashiro, Shuhei Tashiro, who is now studying in the Hyderabad University. ご紹介ありがとうございます。えー、皆さん、こんにちは、こんばんは。えー、あ最初、ちょっと日、えー、両方話させていただきます。えー、本セッションで、えー、モデレーターを務めさせていただきます。田代周平と、えー、申します。Um, hi,、um, my name is 周平、um, and I will be moderating this session.、Um, ご紹介いただいたように、えっと、エコロジカルミームスの共同代表と、えっと、ドイツのハイデルベルク大学大学院にて、えー、人類学を専攻しています。えー、um, so I co-direct ecological memes,、uh, the host of this event,、um, and I also,、um, a, I am a graduate student of anthropology at Heidelberg University in Germany. Um, あ、では、ここから、えー、日本語で話します。えー本セッションはですね、so、this session, アートから眺めるアニメズム、西洋と東洋の科学と宗教ということで、Look at the animism from the perspective of Western, East and Science and Religion, and the main theme of the forum, Animism, What is Animism? We are going to、um, redefine it in the context of modern society. This is what we hope to achieve. And we have invited two speakers today. The first one is. So, the first speaker is a professor from Rikyo University, Katsumi Okuno.、Uh, he is specialized in anthropology and he has investigated shamanism in the Borneo in Malaysia and doing his field work there. And recent years, you, as you might know,、uh, he is known for his studies on multi species anthropology. So he's been, he has published several books and he's been pretty active inside of academia and outside of academia. And the second speaker is artist, writer, and researcher, Anna is Karenin. Anais is, belongs to、uh, Sao Paulo University in Brazil and Waseda University in Japan. And her study is focusing on animism and art. And not only in Japan, but in Germany and Brazil, she has been、um, active globally. So, thank you, Anais, for joining us today. So, in this session, we will invite、uh, Dr. Okuna to speak first, followed by、uh, Ms. Anais Karen. And we invite all the participants to、um, put your questions and comments in the chat. So,、uh, Dr. Okuno, please. So, I would like to start. So, as、uh, Shuhei introduced me, I have been doing research on hunter gatherers living in the tropical rainforest of Borneo. And in this presentation,、uh, We'll focus on an anthropological understanding of animism in gold 
will ourselves in Japanese animism and Buddhism. And I will talk mainly about the animism theories, discussing the three books on animism that I myself have published so far. And in the translation of Ingold and Wheeler Self that I've been involved. In particular, I will build on the essence of what I have discussed in my book, Entangled Life, and in Animism Today, which is a book in the center of the slide, which I co-authored with a philosopher, Takashi Shimizu. And what I would like to explore is what animism is. So before I begin my presentation, I would like to talk briefly about multi-species anthropology. It is multi-species anthropology is an anthropology that advances by repositioning humans within a multi-species context. It also has the same theme as animism in that it doesn't make humans the sole masters of the earth. So from the perspective of this forum, the animism focuses on something spiritual and multi-species focuses on something physical but they are like twins. So now as an introduction and in considering why animism is so important today, I would like to focus here on the COVID infection. In the end of, as of the end of February 2020, when the COVID began to spread around the world, anthropologist Keck's interview article was thought-provoking. According to him, but were medieval devils in Europe until the 19th century. But then, as a result of deforestation by humans, the bats lost their habitat and were forced to move closer to human settlements, where they became our close neighbors. Since the latter half of the 20th century, infectious diseases of zoonotic origin have been increasing. One reason for this is considered to be humans destroying the global environment and pursuing development and thus depriving the animals of their habitat, which led to their movement closer to humans and also humans illegally catching the wild animals and getting too close to them and hence causing the transfer of the viruses coexisted with animals and humans. So when and how did the invasion and domination of nature by humans that led to this situation take place? We can see the origin of the problems in the Renaissance. Before the Renaissance, men, was like an insect before God and the authority of the Christian church. But between the 14th and 16th centuries, man was raised to his greatness by developing and refining his talents and qualities and exploring his potential. Man could do anything, so it was believed. Ever since, man has established the modern world and risen to become the master of all being on earth. It is a major characteristic of modern man to think that he can do everything on his own, says writer Hiroyuki Itsuki. 
humans have been to the moon. Overconfidence in his own power eventually led to arrogance. Man began to exploit nature on his own as he pleases, went deeper into nature and dominated it. One of the reasons for the global spread of COVID can be attributed to such human behavior. But we are currently at the mercy of an entity beyond human, the coronavirus, and we're being tossed about left and right. But our dismay is due to our human-centered behavior, and perhaps we haven't yet fully been aware of it. In any case, relying solely on the power of man, convinced that man is a master of the arts and entitled to exploit nature as he wishes, is the kind of idea, I believe, that we have unwittingly spread throughout the human race since the Renaissance. But there is an ideology completely opposite to this. And that is animism. Animism is an ideology that sees man not as a sole master of the art. It is not an old religious form of mankind or a mere belief in spirits. It is a spiritual tendency of humans. We humans all have. So first, let us briefly look at how animism has been discussed. The first, so the first appearance of the term animism dates back to Edward Tyler's primitive culture in 1871. Tyler defined religion as a belief in various spiritual beings, and he named the doctrine of various spiritual beings lying in the depths of the human psyche as animism. According to Tyler, the interpretation of dreams and other visions as ghosts was made possible by animism, a primitive but coherent and rational philosophy. Tyler's animism is the belief that non-human beings also have souls. In this view, there was an under and dualistic thinking that saw humans and non humans as distinct, that non humans had souls similar to humans, and that, project, that projected human nature onto non humans. It was a projectionism based on the dualism of human and non-human, culture and nature. However, animism, especially in anthropology, was thrown out of the area of interest in the 20th century, and no further progress was made in the discussion. A century later, at the end of the 20th century, animism was again taken up in the so-called ontological turn of anthropology. Its leading figure was Descola, known for his investigation of the South American indigenous Azure. Descola started from the idea that humans identify with their surrounding environment. So the process of identification is patterned by the subject's perception of the surrounding object at sharing or not sharing the attributes of interiority and corporeality. This color redefines amenism as the continuity of interiority and discontinuity of corporeality between subject and object. In areas where animism is found, people impose subjectivity on plants, animals, and nature, and establish friendships, exchanges, seductions, and hostilities with them. In these animistic worlds, it is intuited that animals and spirits 
have the same internal nature as humans, although their physicality differs from that of humans. On the other hand, they have the same interiority as humans. That's what is intuited. This scholar's theory of animism appears to go beyond Tyler's classic definition to a more universal definition of animism. So what we can extract from here is that and the idea that the various beings on Earth share a similar interiority and see that humans are not the only masters on Earth, in my own term, that is animism. In contrast, Viveros de Castro, who conducted research on the Alaware indigenous people of South America, criticizes the scholar for talking about animism by bringing and projecting the differences and qualities of the human world into the non-human world. If this is projectionism, then the scholar too has not left the realm of Tylerian dualistic animism. Here too, the sense of dualistically rooted insufficiency that lurks in animism theory remains. One clue to escaping this dualistic thinking is to refer to Ingo's phenomenological theory of animism, which sees animism as a dynamic process rather than as a static entity. It is called phenomenological theory of an animism. That's what I see, see uh, that we can use as the clue here. Ingold discusses a 1930s dialogue between um, the anthropologist Hallowell and the elder barons of Canada's indigenous Ojibwa people about the stone. Given that the Ojibwa word for stone grammatically belongs to living beings, Hallowell asks barons, are all the stones around us that we see alive? And after thinking for a moment, Barons replied, no, but some are alive. Ingold thinks this way. For those of us with a scientific education, we distinguish between experience and imagination. But for Barons, there is not much difference between experience and imagination. What Barons meant was that the answer lies in the union of experience and imagination. Ingold says that Barron's narrative was not a statement of experience, but of the permanent source of wonder and amazement with imagination as what is now being formed faces the world. Ingo tells us that if we do not look only at experience, but try to grasp the world that appears before us at the very moment when the stone, stone appears, we will see experience and imagination. He also said it's a fact and imagination, but I'm just talking about experience and imagination here. And they melt together and you see the stone move and speak. That's what Ingold said. That is Ingold's animism. To add a point here, the book is translated into Japanese, but it's called um, Being Alive. Um, that's uh, written by Ingold. And um, Ingold's interest in animate existence is not a static noun, one that separates life from non-life, but a verb view of life. Thus, the title of his most famous work, Being Alive, should be read not as a verbal noun, but as a verb. And the Japanese translation of the title, it's expressed as a noun, but it should be a verb. Thus, in Gaudian understanding of animism was explored in ethnography by Willersworth from Denmark. Willersworth 
focused on the animism found in the elk hunting of the Yukagir, a Siberian hunting tribe. According to Waller's love, animism is a set of beliefs that endow animals with intellectual, emotional, and spiritual qualities comparable to those of the human personality. On the evening before the hunt, the Yukagir hunter puts vodka, tobacco, and other imported trade goods on the fire to put the ruling spirit of the elk and a salacious mood. The hunted spirit then visits the dominant spirit's house in the dream, disguised as an animal. There, the dominant spirit, drunk and captivated by sexual desire, thinks the intruder is his lover and goes to bed with her. The romantic feelings arouse and the dominant spirit by the hunter's spirit are extended to the prey animal. Thus, the next morning, when the hunter goes out hunting and finds an elk and begins to intimate, uh, imitate it. The animal rushes to him in anticipation of the climax of his sexual arousal. The hunter sees the elk stepping toward him and he himself imitates the elk and he sees himself imitating the elk. The hunter with the elk in front of him goes back and forth between the elk he is imitating and himself who is imitating the elk. Willis Left describes that double perspective as a kind of visual oscillation. In that oscillation, what alternate at high speed are the hunter as the subject looking at the elk, the hunter being looked at by the elk, and the hunter looking at himself. And so the boundary separating the human and the elk species disappears and a unity is experienced. In the midst of such a high speed oscillating process, the hunter cannot deny the elk's personal uh, personhood, he says. The hunter immersed in the hunt is endowed with his own personality from the animal's personality. Through the high-speed exchange of subject and object in the practice of hunting, human personhood is not a given, not from the beginning, but is bestowed by the animal in the process of hunting practice. You could hear animism is a belief and practice in which the boundaries separating beings gradually fade in the oscillation of I am not me and I am not not me between humans and non-humans, such as animals, inanimate objects and spirits, and beings with intellectual, emotional, and spiritual qualities equal to those of the human personality emerge. Willerslev, who succeeded in gold, can be said to have brought to life the emergence of animism and the dynamic process of fading, facing the elk. Here we can see one boiling point of animism in contemporary anthropology. Animism is not something that is statistically extracted as an entity, but is the product of an amalgam of experience and imagination hidden in a dynamic movement. Simply saying that something is animistic is not enough to reach animism itself. Only in the midst of reality that is captured in the interaction with the subject right in the middle of the phenomenon, I mean, animism is set in motion. By the way, it is not surprising that the animism of the indigenous peoples of the north is related to the animism of the geographically close Tohoku region of the Japanese archipelago. Animism is also strongly evident in the works of Kenji Miyazawa, a native of Iwate Prefecture. Kenji's works depict an animism in which the boundary between humans and other species is not clearly defined, but the two become one. So, in the children's story, The Beginning of the Deer Dance, written by Kenji Miyazawa, the main character 
Kaju realizes one evening that he has forgotten his hand towel. After eating and leaving leftover horse chestnut dumpling on the long grass and walking away, when he returns to the spot, he sees six deer circling around the dumplings. And he was so captivated by the dance, and he started to think that he was a deer himself, but then he watches his big hands and realizes that he is a human and stops to run out to join the dance circle. So meanwhile, the boundary between humans and deer gradually fades in Kaju's mind. But the boundary between man and deer, which his large hands had held, held in place, is momentarily lost, and Kaju, forgetting the difference between himself and the deer, finally leaps out from behind the pampas grass. So there we see a tension field scene where Kaju moves back and forth between human and deer. His mind is already a deer, but when he looks at his hands, he's aware that he's not a deer, but a human being. Not only uh, Kenji's work, but the Japanese uh, Japanese literature is uh, like treasure trove of, trove of animism. So let's take Hiromi Kawakami's novel, Treating on Snakes, where a snake becomes a man and then becomes a snake again and vice versa. A man is invited into the world of snakes, which can be either beings. So they are men and snake are not stable species, but both can be either. In several of Kawakami's novels, he depicts a world in which people and animals melt and mingle commune and mix. If you take it as animism, we can understand animism um, having a um, mobile strip like structure. Its character is that the front is connected to the back and the back is connected to the front. So the way a person somehow becomes a snake and then without knowing becomes a person again is represented by this geometric model. And finally, I would like to talk about the Ainu's Kuma Okuri Bear Sacrifice Ritual, which is, uh, if you can see on the picture on the right side, Kuma Okuri is an Ainu ritual of sending the soul of a bear to the world of the Kami. And here too, the soul of a bear reaches the world of the Kami, connected through the mobile strip where there is no front or back. And Kami becomes a bear and comes back to this world again with souvenir of flesh and fur. So in Kami Okuri, there is a mobile strip like pathway where the bear becomes Kami and Kami becomes bear. On the other hand, we who live in the modern world, this pathway may be blocked by something like a tall wall, closing us off from the world on the other side. A world is like a boundary that cuts off human beings from the pathway to the non-human world and confines them to the human-only world. Believing that there is nothing that cannot be done by humans and developing their ability and technology, humans have been exploiting nature external to them as they please and have constructed a comfortable space for humans alone. And in addition, animism is made up of the dynamism of the back and forth movement of the world, which has has an inextricable structure between this side and that side. And this is the final slide. So far, we have started with Tyler's animism 150 years ago, being based on the dualism between human and non-human. 
and then moved on to modern animism, understood as an inner continuity between human and non-human, and then took a glance at animism as it appears in movement, followed by a look at animism as it appears in Japanese fairy tales, novels, and rituals. Animism can be considered as a name given to a certain practical sense of human understanding of the world. But let me conclude by mentioning that there was a more systematic delineation of animism, especially in Japan, that is Buddhist thought. Since I mentioned dualism, some of you may have recalled the Kagon philosophy of one equals many and many equals one. And this was flourished in China, but in particular, Japanese Buddhism since the 13th century contains many explanations for handling animism. And it has many different themes, but here we would like to, I would like to focus on three points. Genshoron theory of going and returning, Tariki, the other power, and Doji, synchronicity, with no front or back, consisting only of one side, the animism that goes back and forth on the pathway of Mobius Strip is precisely the image of pure land philosophy, where sentient beings, sattva, are reborn in the pure land and return to save sattva sentient beings. In both animism and theory of Gensho, Gensho-ron, there is a connecting pathway. When the Ainu people send bears through the pathway, as in the theory of Gensho, they are praying that the bears themselves will eventually return. Humans have bears, but it is not because humans are strong and powerful. In the Ayn ontology, bears come to the human world because they want to. Because Ayn has been this is derived from the fact that Ainu people have always depended on the precious sustenance that comes from the world of the ma Kami for the, their livelihood, the other side. The Ainu Kuma Okuri shows that Ainu hunting was not carried out relying on their own power, but on the other power. But Shinran theory of the other power and the idea of Jinen Hoji represent an important trigger for animism to be set in motion. And in contrast to this pure land Buddhism, I would like to focus on synchronicity as explored in Zen Buddhism. Well, this may not be known outside of Japan or not even Japan, but Keiji Iwata, he's an animist theorist. Um, he believed that synchronicity was at the root of amnesiaism, the idea of which was based on the world of enlightenment told by 13th century Zen Master Dogen. And Saint Jungian synchronicity would help us understand his point. Jung's synchronicity is a coincidence of multiple events that are not causally connected, but for which some semantic connection is felt or the principle of non causal. Conjunction. Iwata says that animism is the surprise you feel in the moment when our world, where the law of causality is at work, comes into contact with the world of the principle of non causal linkage. When you pull a radish out of the group clutching a green leaf, you feel a moment of creation and feel kami. This is animism, according to Iwata. 
that he said lies the world of Gigi Muge or freedom as the absolute ultimate boundary opened up by the wisdom of enlightenment. Let me summarize. Animism is dynamic in its Mobius strip-like structure and at the same time as a characteristic of its temporal temporality, it falls in simultaneously. In Japan, it is often said that Shintoism has inherited ancient animism. However, in that it is based on a scaffolding of non-dualism, dynamic, other power theory, and temporalism, animism is logically Buddhist. That is it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Okuno. That was a fascinating presentation, starting from Corona pandemic, going through Tyler, Phillips, Ingold, and Willers Love. You mentioned literature, Japanese literature, and based on the Mobius strip, you also explored animism and also mentioned um, religious aspect of that as well. So it encompassed a wide variety of fields. So we are going to uh, have Anais to give her presentation for us. Are you ready, Anais? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, I'm going to share. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to, to start like briefly uh, introducing me uh, as a PhD fellow at Sao Paulo University in the Department of uh, Arts. And uh, I'm also a fellow at uh, Los Angeles University in the Department of International Culture and Communication Studies. So um, first of all, I would like to share with all of you my background uh, in my artwork that it's uh, from where uh, it's influenced all my art practice. And uh, today I will share with you uh, a little bit of my art practice and all the backgrounds that also is related to my my narrative, my personal narratives, and with some um, theories also that guide me uh, in my deliberation of my thinking and my artwork. So uh, as you're seeing, like uh, you have, have here the map of Brazil, uh, which uh, I want to show you uh, the different uh, kind of biomas that exist in Brazil. So you don't have uh, only one kind of uh, landscape that we are used to think, for example, some, uh, as Amazon in this uh, region, but also we have a different uh, kind of uh, landscapes, for example, more dry, that are located specifically like in this region that's called Caatinga or Cerrado. Uh, so my family comes from these uh, two regions uh, that we call, like in generalistic way, we call Sertão which means these dry land areas uh, of Caatinga biome. And Caatinga come from Caatinga, that is uh, a Tupi uh, ethnicity, indigenous ethnicity word. Uh, so it means white forest. So it's the description of this kind of uh, uh, landscape that in part, like most of half of the year is completely dry. And then with it rains and some parts uh, of this uh, place becomes uh, some kind of uh, lake, rivers, uh, because it's a lot of rain. So it's like a landscape that is in process of changing continu continuously. And from this context, uh, many narratives and storytelling, they start to be developed because of this relation uh, with the nature that is not a nature that provides you the source only, but it's a nature which will struggle together and you build together this landscape in an effort for living uh, with these beings as part of your kinship, as part of your family. So from this context, uh, I started to, to study like uh, medicinal plants, uh, connecting with my ancestry uh, from, from these regions. So the medicinal plants way of learning 
It is mostly related to the gathering of groups with uh, uh, people like connecting with their generations through the generations knowledge that is being transmitted. And uh, in this kind of uh, process, most of uh, the most important thing is like the relation with intuition and the relation with uh, the communication with plants. That is a communication that go beyond borders. Uh, so I tr I've tried to, to restore this connection with plants uh, through this knowledge, and something that I've I met it was this uh, with this relation with the storytelling and the animism that is uh, most important to this cosmological relations that was being established in this area. So m m both my mother and my parents they come from uh, these dry areas and they come from farmers' family. So this relation of the with nature uh, that is um, coexistence interrelated is something that influenced me a lot uh, since I was fourteen years old, connecting with this uh, sort of knowledge. Um, so briefly, I want to introduce uh, some of my artworks. I'm not going to explain in details all of my artworks. I just want to illustrate uh, briefly how all this knowledge, they cross my artistic practice and why I think as uh, the art as some sort of way to explain and to express this influence of animism and storytelling and plants in my art practice. So this artwork that is called Borderless Matter, uh, I'm using a technique uh, of extracting the substance of plants. So this is a uh, connected with tr traditional technologies, techniques that I use to make uh, medicinal uh, medicines from uh, plants or from the sacred plants. And in this artwork, you can see uh, uh, also a herb garden that will be uh, nurtured, like it will be like being nurtured by medicinal uh, water. So this pump and cycle goes to the, the, the garden and nurture this. So what you can see here is these two different uh, substances where you have the plants that become completely transparent during this process. So kind of like expression of the spirit of the plant. And then you have the color itself that is the substance that during the exhibition will be evaporated and the people can breathe this, uh, this air and connect with the plants in this invisible way. So this relation with the idea of connecting with this, uh, the systems and these invisible ways of in my artwork, they also cross uh, visually with these aesthetics of science. As you can see, these tubes can remember us some of these techniques. So why I'm relating to science as a dispositive and uh, crossing this with cosmological narratives. Uh, what I'm trying to, to discuss is something that is uh, specifically uh, regarding to Brazilian uh, colonial context. So I'm trying to discuss uh, in this context like, how the hierarchy between different knowledge, knowledge systems, they spread through the times and what we have in the end of this process. Uh, so in Brazil, the history of science and the, the development of the scientific perspective it is completely uh, comes along with the process of colonialism, of the colonialism from Europe in Brazil. And uh, something that is important is to think on the representation of nature that was established during this time that uh, Nancy Lee Stephen, she discussed, she discussed this really uh, amazing way in this, uh, this book. And uh, what she's trying to say is how much the the imaginary about uh, nature in Brazil in this period uh, is uh, re connected with the process of shifting the animism perspective and the animism thinking to a perspective where uh, nature and humans uh, start to be considered and narrated as separately. So I'm, I started to think on these historical shifts and uh, for example, this is one artwork that uses a similar technique, but uh, here I'm trying to use these colors of the plants to uh, coloring uh, in a different ways uh, this uh, historical image of the representation of uh, natural lands in Brazil. That is an image made by a naturalistic, a, a European naturalist. So I'm trying to discuss uh, like what is... Um, 
what is the, the truth uh, of these images and what kind of imaginary is uh, start from this uh, kind of uh, relationship with nature that uh, is transformed and how modern society, they uh, kind of forget animism uh, cosmologies in Brazil in this period and start to be uh, influenced by more rational thinking. Uh, so something that is also really important in my artwork uh, and I want to share with you today is the discussion regarding uh, another theoretical perspective that is like the relationship with life in general ways. So something that is a really important discussion in animism is thinking of the relationship with life as in certain way uh, most of uh, the uh, animist uh, theorists they are suggesting this, this idea of like at how much life is uh, beyond um, the borders of humans and they spread in other organisms. But uh, Elizabeth Povinelli, uh, that she is an anthropologist, she's been discussing like through the theory of geontologies, uh, the perspective of like the life in stones and thinking like specifically like she's related to the Kaha beings that are an ethnicity from uh, Australia and their relationships with the stones. Uh, she understood that animism was not enough to explain how they relate to the stones. And why is that? So for explaining this, Elizabeth Povinelli, she comes, she gives like some steps back to think about, for example, how uh, Michel Foucault explained the biopower. So it's like this, uh, how liberal uh, society try to control life in different ways. And she questioned like the most uh, important is not just thinking about how we try to control life, but rather like what is life? Uh, so thinking of the scientific concept of life that is of being born, reproducing and dying, she started to think about uh, the system um, and think like it excludes viruses, stones and other organisms that lives in the deserts that are not included on this kind of cycle. So just this division between uh, what is life and what is not life is the first uh, question of, uh, of Povinelli. And I suggest that is kind of suggesting maybe kind of give up of uh, only explaining things through the idea of life and uh, explaining them in a, in a way that go beyond. So it's how we can think about uh, the geontologist, for example. Uh, so in this artwork, for example, I'm trying to question these barriers uh, between the elements, uh, not only the stones, but also uh, I've been questioned the relation with the artificial matter and how also these matters can be considered as uh, alive or not, uh, as they do not do not fit the scientific uh, perceptions. So uh, in this artwork, we have a process where the the substance extracted from the plants they are being absorbed like by, by mineral salts on the stone. So you have this process of like one uh, element transforming into another and thinking about how much this interdependence, interdependency between the substance, uh, they are much more uh, complex than we can understand just uh, using the, the concepts of science, for example, uh, considering the relation with life. So also in this artwork, a plant, a mineral, uh, meaning of life or resonance of water, uh, I'm also discussing this uh, question, this relation between uh, plants and stones, uh, specifically in a region uh, that is in Zao. So I was researching the Zao, like volcanic region in Japan in the, during a residency and thinking how volcanic area you have a really um, uh, interdependent relations between uh, the ocean water system that is full of different minerals and also the plants water system. Uh, so like uh, in, in these regions, uh, volcanic areas, you have a really um, interconnected uh, diversity of the plants it is interconnected with the volcano explosions. So much more minerals and diverse minerals you have in the soil, much more plants will grow in this area and different species of plants will be able to uh, resist in the same area without the competition. So also I've been thinking about uh, these relationships and the interdependence uh, between plants and stones in this matter, like in this region. 
Uh, but something that is most important in my artwork uh, is thinking on the how to bring um, this uh, animistic practice to late day life. And something that I've been su suggesting is like the process of listening to the plants. So like what means listening to the plants when it comes for uh, with this concept that I'm trying to to uh, this theory that I'm trying to uh, propose in my doctoral thesis that I will finish in ne next year that is more than plants. So I'm trying to thinking on the non-universalization of the scientific divisions and concepts, which means not think not saying that these divisions are not important for science, but why this the, the scientific definitions they should decide how we will relate to these uh, organisms in our daily life. So, for example, in Brazilian uh, indigenous societies, uh, there's many uh, societies that relate much more and communicate much more with some specific species of plants they consider as a family. They, they develop a kinship and a narrative together with them, more than, for example, with non-indigenous human beings. So what I'm suggesting, I'm thinking about the idea of more than plant, uh, is establishing, like trying to figure out and establishing uh, another ways to communicate with these invisible ways of uh, existence and through the knowledge of plants and uh, through the knowledge of their spirit, which means through intimacy and intuition. That is uh, this silent and uh, vibrational way of communicating. So, for example, in this artwork on visual latency, like as I'm using a technique that I introduced before of the transparency of plants, but uh, in this artwork, I'm not... Um, bringing the substance itself uh, as the green, as you saw in other artworks, but rather are transformed this substance into sound. So this is a complex theory that I've developed uh, together with a sound artist that is called Tatsuro Murakami. I'm not going to explain further all the process of the technique. Uh, just here you have this uh, visual scheme uh, where you can see this complex relation between sound vibrations uh, and the color codes. But uh, what I want to express through this process of transforming plants into a sound uh, is a show that the plants, the sound as non-visual and vibrational elements that can be hearing or even not if for people that are not be able to hear, they can feel the vibration through the air. For me is to explain how the plants, they, uh, they are like a definition that go much beyond what we can see and what we can touch, but they are relating to us uh, in, a, in a more deep way. That for me is like the process of animism that I, I bring and how I express this animism uh, in the process of connecting and learning from uh, traditional knowledge with plants uh, in this intuitive way. Uh, and then uh, finally, I would like to uh, briefly talk about this artwork that is called the Komape. So this artwork now uh, is on view at the fifth floor until tomorrow. So tomorrow is the last day to see this artwork. Um, and um, it's part of a group show in the space in Tokyo for the people who don't know that's the name, the fifth floor. It's in Ezu. Uh, and this artwork is based on my research about Tone River, the, which is a river uh, that was transposed uh, during a 60 year uh, works that uh, it was before it comes from Ominakami in Guma until Tokyo Bay. But now uh, the flow of the river is going uh, and, uh, to Tokyo, uh, sorry, to Chiba Ocean. So this transforming of the process of the, the way of the river is something that I've been questioning. So society, uh, developed uh, the system of understanding how the rivers can um, be adapted to, to urban uh, environment, not considering where's, where the spirit of the river wants to go itself. So through the word the Komape, that is the title of the artwork, uh, I identify the Ainu relation with the rivers. Uh, that means there is the, the spirit of the river that goes up so I knew people have the idea of like the the spirit of the river not going down but up. Uh, 
and why I'm going to Ainu um, uh, mythology and uh, cosmology to think about this river is because Tone, uh, there is some suggestions that it comes from Toine, that is Ainu Go, so the name of the river also express some sort of relation that was established in real anxiety times in this area of Japan uh, with Ainu people as well. And uh, I think it's really important to, to think in other ways of worshipping the rivers and not thinking the rivers as just uh, some source, source to be used by humans. So in this artwork, also the word Rikomape was transformed into a sound and it's play like in this cycle, like in loop tape that uh, interesting, interestingly, we can think about uh, also the what Okonosan says before about this Mebius uh, tape that is in the, this round cycle. Uh, what is interesting in this artwork is during the process, the, uh, the tape is becoming erased and it's being like, uh, the, the, uh, magnetic particles that maintain the sound, they start to disappear. So, uh, most of the artwork is based on this process of like disappearance as well. So here you have also the substance of the plant that the plant is distracted, the plant is transparent. Uh, and what I'm trying to, to express in this artwork is this relationship with how we can connect again with this daily practice of worshipping uh, the entities that are part of our daily life uh, that we uh, start to forget through the time. So my main uh, proposition is to think as an animism, as a society-specific experience which means suggesting that uh, animism should exist in different contexts and related to different elements and culture uh, and establish through the, this effort of communicating with these organisms, with the scientific knowledge, with mythologies. Uh, so the intention is that, so for me, I think on you know, the, the, the potency of art to create new mythologies, to create new ways of uh, worshipping uh, these uh, elements in daily practice life. Uh, connecting with this critical uh, perspective of the, the shifting that, of course, it comes from my background in Brazil, but also thinking on different places around the world that the modern society uh, made us kind of forget this old uh, experience and practice with, uh, with plants, with uh, rivers, with stones, with many other elements. So why I try to suggest in my artworks is generate a space where you can question these uh, relations and rather like start to create your own sensitive uh, experience and your own sensitive ways to communicate with these beings through animism and new mythologies. So uh, basically, this is my um, my talk for today, and thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this fascinating uh, presentation and nice. Um, I think it was really interesting that you went over many topics to to introduce and define your works. And at the same time, one of the central concepts in your work, so list, the act of listening to, to plants, um, I thought um, had a very um, uh, similar resonance with what Okuno-san is talking about um, in terms of um, uh, the idea that humans are not uh, the only masters um, of the earth, but instead um, it, animistic idea, uh, ontology requires a mode of listening um, to the life of other beings. Thank you. So, uh, so ですね。えっと、これ、ここから、えー、ダイアログの、えー、時間に入っていければと思います。えー、まずはですね、その奥の、えー、先生の方に、えっと、質問を so we'd like to start the dialogue. I'd like to ask Okno Sensei first some questions. Because we have only limited time, I'd like to just focus on a couple questions. So you mentioned 
the uh, human's quality is projected to non-humans in the late 19th century that started. And after uh, a little less than one um, century, animism was not a focus of study in anthropology. But with uh, this color and the Rivales, the Castro, they started um, ontological turn, uh, they started to mention and study animism within that category. So in one word, animism was forgotten for that time frame, and I'm wondering why, and why was it brought up again as a, a major topic in recent years? Okay, so why was it forgotten? It's simple. The discussion of animism was conducted in the cultural evolution, evolution of discussion or theory in the late 19th century that was studied in the uh, cultural evolution uh, theory. So that means animism is the first uh, religion in an undeveloped society. That is how they captured animism. So it is the religion grasped or held by the uh, undeveloped uh, culture. But in 20th century, it started to be denied totally. And discussion of animism faded accordingly. So that is the simple reason of that. And why? In the late 20th century, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, animism was brought up again in anthropology. Why is that? To that question, I have two answers off the top of my head. One is... In Japan, if you study anthropology in Japan, American anthropology has a huge impact on it, you realize. Postmodern, post colonial anthropology in late 20th century was dominated by this. Uh, the um, cultural anthropology was dominated by this. So we started to reflect on that. What are we doing? And that went on for uh, a quarter of a century. So if you study anthropology in Japan, you feel the great impact of American anthropology, and I feel that uh, the impact really greatly recently as well. So I think the anthropology studied uh, or explored in America and Britain um, is sort of different from what we do here in Japan. In France, they studied ethno uh, ethnography or ethnicity. Um, in America, uh, it was called um, cultural anthropology, they respectively had um, their own history. And anthropology is not to reflect on what happened, but rather the past theories that we have sought, um, mainly by Malinowski and others, a structural uh, anthropology based on that. In the 20th century, we continued on with our studies of anthropology. And in doing so, the research of animism, as I mentioned, was sought by Rivera's de Castro and Descala. They were uh, students of uh, those uh, researchers that I mentioned earlier, uh, French academists. So that school of thought uh, was born in France. And also in the year 2007, Henale and Hobrat and Wastel, those three researchers issued a theory, uh, uh, a thesis called Thinking Through Things. And in that, they clarified 
人類学の中に、えーまああのまあ、後付けたというか、uh, They repositioned、uh, the start of、um, thinking、uh, in anthropology. So it is a research of things. As you can tell, a thesis is about that. And many anthropologists,、uh, or all anthropologists would know, but the, uh, uh, there is a, a quiet revolution of anthropology emerging recently. Someone like Latour, Latour uh, Strazan, Jill, and Viveris de Castro, and Roy Wagner. Those five people are the main players in this. The scholar、uh, is not included, but these five are the main players. And everyone、um, except for Wagner is from、uh, Britain, and they're all anthropologists from Britain. So, relationship with things、um, is. Uh, from the ontology, ontological perspective, relationship、uh, with non humans, so relationship with non humans or things were a great focus, major focus of their studies. And within that process, animism re emerged. As a field of anthropology. Thank you very much. So, the existential、uh, theory it played a major role in that. I, I think、um, it's,、uh, anthropologists、um, are familiar with that term, but I'd like to add to that、uh, so、for、uh, lay people to understand. So, someone like Viveros de Castro,、um, they、uh, touted this、uh, thinking, and then that spread all over the world. In the Western ideology or anthropology, multiculturalism that was thought to be universal at the time, within that, there's only one nature. That's why there is a multiple or many different、uh, cultures. But that was criticized by them because, for example, for people in Amazon, not the culture, but that nature or physicality. As you mentioned when you spoke about this color, interiority and physicality, the continuity of those two,、uh, I think it's related to that. But there were many of them. So there is an existence of multi naturalism. That was、uh, that was criticized, and that new newly born theory. So, and based on that history,、uh, something.、Uh, and I, so,、um, in your presentation,、um, you mentioned that、um, you combine、um, indigenous methods、uh, with sort of your understanding of science,、um, and、uh, and this is、uh, based on your understanding of of history of.、Uh, Erasure,、uh, so to speak, of traditional、um, ancestral modes of of engaging with plants, and you said that you extract、uh, medicinal elements、um, from plants、uh, by using traditional、uh, methods. Can you maybe explain in a, li a little bit more detail, like how you extract、uh, your, your elements? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and it leads me to、uh, also explaining this relationship with、uh, scientific and uh, metallurgical, uh, uh, cosmological proced proceedings and knowledge.、Uh, so I've learned、uh, this kind of practice, as I said, like from this traditional knowledge in Brazil. And something that is really important in this process is the process of like ritualistic、uh, practice. And、uh, more spiritual practice that is uh, uh, in the process of like worshiping the plants、uh, while you're pre preparing these medicines. So the thing is, like, I started this this kind of practice and technique doing my own 
medicinal pharmacy and like uh, helping people around me to heal themselves and to heal myself using medicinal plants. Uh, so in this process, I discovered that it, it could be possible to make the plant to become completely transparent. So it was a discover during the process of doing uh, the, the medicines from plants. So like, as I said, I started with 14 years old, so I was not intending to do artwork in that period. I was just intending to connect with plants and with this mm. uh, healing knowledge in the plants. Uh, so then I discover like this technique and discover also that in science, you can use this source of sort of like not exactly uh, techniques similar, but you can reach this similar result uh, to the transparency of the plants that you use in, is using in laboratories just uh, to analyze the structure of the plant. So they need known color in the plants to understand the structure of the leaf, for example. So this similarity uh, in like results with different proceedings and intentions is like the, the things that more, more interest me. So uh, in terms of like scientific procedures, you can extract this using solvents uh, and substance that are mainly chemical. But in my process, I use different, more uh, plant-based materials and proceedings. And something that is interesting is that I cannot reveal this process because it's full of this uh, kind of mysteries and secrets that is behind the process of doing a, a medicine. So it's not just about technique, but it's about like the worshiping process that I enter while doing this. So this is something that I cannot reveal. And also like in Brazil, like the process of learning about medicinal plants is full of these secrets and mysteries that you cannot just have a receipt and recipe and use this. You have to pass through the process to be able to reach the relationship with uh, each plant. That also, again, it's something, some relation that I cannot apply to any plant uh, mm. because it's not just a technique, but it's a relationship that should be develop it and grow to the times through the years so mm. that's fascinating so so when you extract you worship the plants and i think in that process you give some agency to the plants right so this plant um has the power to influence the way um you understand the world and 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 the way you uh you create based on that understanding. And I think this is something related to um, Okuno-san's idea of tariki. Um, so, um, Okuno-san, Okuno その、その、えっと、listening えっと、えー、to plants. Eh, so, during the analysis talk, uh, Anais was talking about listening to plants. When she talked about, she talked about more than plants. And she talked about communicating and relating to plants beyond the way that modern society does. And that reminded me of your uh, story about a book where a man, snake becomes man and man becomes snake. And so there was a concept of different species merging together. And that concept can be considered um, similar to what Anais was saying, which gives agency to the plants or non-human beings. So as you mentioned, the other power, you have explained the difference between um, anthropologies of uh, different countries. But as you studied anthropology, um, you mentioned the uh, power of the other. And I thought it was characteristic of your discussion that uh, you brought in the idea of the other power into the discussion of animism. So yes, um, this is a Buddhist concept. So the idea is that humans 
ability that we have and we develop our um, ability and technology and that humans can do everything and we do things with confidence we start doing this after um, renaissance as i mentioned in my talk so this is a underlying assumption we have and this um, scientific rationalism focuses on self-ability of humans, jiriki, saying that humans have power to create and control that builds our modern society. But what lies at the opposite of jiriki or self-reliance is the concept of relying on other power, the power of the world beyond human, something beyond human, and relying on its power, the other power, by letting of, of self-power, which we do less and less these days. So for example, like I specifically mentioned before, Hiroyuki Tsuki, a famous author in Japan, he discusses it in detail. So the tariki, the power of other, well, this book was actually published in English as well and was sold uh, quite well. So when he was young, he went back to study uh, Buddhism and he has written an essay focused on Buddhist teachings. And not many people know about this, but he, the, Hiroyuki Itsuki, has written a lot of essays on animism. And what you can find in his writings is that pure land philosophy that he was interested like I said before, um, he discusses a uh, tarikiron theory of our other power. So, which means to rely on the original wish, original wish of um, Amida. Bosats. And that's the source of um, Tariki, the other power. So he says, there's something which lies beyond human's ability and in front of that power, you feel humble. And that kind of sense is important for us humans. So, if you focus too much on the other power, relying on the other power, which I have been discussing in multi-species anthropology, it sounds like preaching because in the animism theory, what we are trying to do is trying to find a different way of uh, doing things that we have been doing in the modern society. But if we um, focus too much on that aspect, I feel that we cannot really grasp what animism is. But I can see how uh, relying on the other power can be preaching, but um, it is important to think. So Anais mentioned that um, to uh, recall the sense or susceptibility to a sense. Uh, uh, Anais, um, 
So I think your concept of listening to plants relates to、um, this idea of tariki,、um, other power, and also how Okunostan defines animism as、uh, the idea of thinking that humans are not the only masters of the earth.、Um, What does it really mean、um, to listen to plants,、um, which of course do not have the same modes of communication as humans do, right?、Um, so, for example, within、uh, multi species anthropology today,、um, there are lots of debates as to how、um, anthropologists can observe、um, and listen to the voices of other than human beings, right?、Um, so, for example, some people say we need to look at the way non humans, humans communicate through. Signs and icons. So that's, for example, Eduardo Cohn.、Um, but others say we need to work with natural scientists. And that is, for example, Anna Tsin.、Um, in any case, there is no consensus、um, in anthropology.、Um, and I think it's because social scientists are not yet equipped with the tools to interpret the natural world. Um, but um, how, how do you, as an artist,、um, practice your mode of attentiveness and, and listening? Yeah, that's a really interesting question.、Uh, and I've been exactly like、uh, suggesting this like,、uh, in part of my thesis、uh, because I think this is the most like the biggest problem we have like, facing today, like a relation with what we call nature, is exactly. Are、um, we, we, we have lost this practice of like connecting with nature and like understanding nature. So I call it like the relation with intuition is really important. For example,、uh, we have、um, uh, in, in traditional like methodologies in Brazil, we have something that is like basically entering the forest and You have the signals of like intuition that you can communicate. You look at the plant and feel, okay, you're, you're a medicina one. So you, you start to relate this with this plant, not exactly like you need a book to identify the plants. You establish a daily life relationship with this. So,、um, it's a really important way of connecting,、uh, with your intuition and with your like other ways of, of knowledge that's not rational only. But what it demands, it's us to step back on like the structure that we are used to, to use to our day life practice that is basically a、uh, rational thinking. So, this is the most problem, like when, when it comes to like developing strategies that doesn't lay down on like only the, the rational thinking and the only on the objective replies. So, like、uh, in, in science, we've been looking for like、uh, practice answers for everything and try to control like the, the replies and the answers of everything. And in humanity science, like、uh, at certain way, most of the time it happens in, in really similar way. So, we need like Direct、uh, answers that reply to directly problems.、Uh, and we are not、uh, able to face a really loss, like, of, like, you know, like you, when you lose your, your floor or when you lose your base and you open to then learn from the beginning. So, like,、uh, it's how we learn how to, to talk in our society is just feeling and observing and connecting little by little and believing on this system. So, what I believe in the relationship with communicating with plants is like each relation、uh, is start a communication, is not a language that you can universalize because I think the most problem、mm-hmm. we have is the, with the universalization. So, we have the idea of like we systematize so then we can apply this for any situation. So, it is not the true with the communication with plants. You need to establish like personal relationships with it related to beliefs. It is related to like、uh, cosmology. It is related to community and community doesn't mean like a group. It can be like just you and a plant and you can develop community. So,、um, this knowledge are still on us. This is what I believe. And this is what I've been seeing like in workshops that I've been doing like in some years before of doing like a workshop with plants, with medicinal plants. It was not like sharing recipes and sharing information, but like learning,、uh, helping people to see that they, they already know in a certain way that we cannot systematize. So, like, this is how I work.、Uh, and this is how,、uh, what I believe that we should try to apply. 
and this is like really complex because it goes in a different in a different way that all of our science like in in, in humanities and in specific science is like different way that is being done but i think is like a way to uh, break the structure of western way of thinking that is spread all over the place and then like create a new way uh, that is laying down in many uh, cultural, like many, many cultures nowadays. Like you can see this, it's like how indigenous people do this. It's like, how do you communicate with plants? I just do this. You know, it's like, d don't have like a systematized way. It's just something that you do. Uh, so we need to break our structural uh, thinking to open to this unstructured one and no rational one. Right, so we questioning universality and at the same time understanding others, non-humans, in a patchy way is what is required right now, I think. Well, the time is quite limited now, but lastly, I'd like to ask Dr. Okuno about what is animism. I would like to revisit that concept. So in your definition, Dr. Okuno, something like Anais nice just mentioned, if you re-question universality in a more open way, how would that be? The humans are not the only masters of the planet, the philosophy of that. I wanted to ask you uh, regarding the scholars' animism theory, where uh, something like thinking or willpower, hearing, perception, effect, effect, effectiveness, uh, those are shared with humans, uh, between humans and non-humans. I think the definition is quite narrow, but Dr. Okuno, you say he, the humans are not the only masters of the planet, Based on that, um, I think that definition can be quite large. And in this year of 2022, I think there is a huge meaning in considering uh, or thinking about animism based on that. So having a wider understanding of animism is how is it related to um, practical, uh, our daily, pra daily practice? And that is a huge scope um, of a question. But what I can say is that animism, which is a disposition, a human disposition, or human tendency. Um, to express animism in a log logic logical way is quite difficult. What is animism? To express that verbally and in letters, that is very, very difficult. So something like the artwork by Anais and other expressive methods would be very meaningful, very valuable, I would say. But at the same time, someone like Dogen, a Buddhist monk, a famous Buddhist monk from Japan, touted at Sansen Somuk Shikai Jobutsu, which means which means the Buddhist nature exists in nature. That's what it means. So expressing something like that in uh, verbally is quite difficult. That's what is said in Buddhism as well. But Dogen, a monk Dogen, expressed that in a, a, ver in a verbal manner he tried at least so nature all of nature uh, he ex expressed that as sensei seikyo so mountains and uh, waters uh, he understood them as a sutra buddhist sutra so expressing something that is not possible to be verbalized 
In trying to do so, we can deepen our understanding of animism. And not only that, we can use other methods of expression. Like I said earlier, I think it's very important. And according to Anais, listening to her presentation, I, it reminded me of what Ratul does. So in studying multi-species, Ratul is excluded. And we have not read um, about Ratul too much ourselves or what he wrote. We have not read that. Um, the uh, social stru structuralism, he touted on the basis that uh, science is a starting point based on scientific matters, Western world is structured or built. That's something humans created. And that is a social structure, structuralism. So with that thinking, by using science, how do we experience world? I think and I says, uh, intention uh, relates to this in a deep manner. What I mean here is that uh, the agency that Ratul uh, uses, the word that Ratul uses often, immediately before the theme of climate change in the past 10 years, oh, immediately before he passed, passed away, he pursued the climate change theme, and he wrote a book called Critical Zones along those lines. And in that book, he mentioned the expression of art as well. He did a experience experiments using art. So not just using scientific matters, but also focusing on ontology or valuing ontology. He, he advocated ontology, by the way. How should we think based on ontology? Something like climate change. When you think about it, climate itself is agency. And in climate change, uh, if, when the temperature rises and the uh, sea surface rises as well, and accordingly, humans would have to evacuate uh, toward uh, higher places. But it doesn't just affect um, the humans, but also other uh, beings as well. If uh, the uh, the uh, seawater, the salt water comes ashore, uh, comes on the ground, and it will impact uh, all the um, plants growing on the seashore. So it impacts both humans and the humans, and the humans recreate infrastructure in order to avoid such a situation. So that is uh, the climate itself, it's the agency. So what Ratul says, um, and short, uh, the modern politics and science problems are the focus of um, his uh, argument in later years. And at the same time, he um, put, uh, actively engaged with art expressions to make its points. And as for anthropology, Ratu was not the only one interested in art and performance, but Ingold as well. He was so interested in that. And anthropology was not approaching science, but it was also approaching art, rather. And the point of that, or heart of that, um, what's missing in anthropology is speculation and experiments. That's what's lacking in anthropology. So anthropology and art, there should be a platform for them to cooperate with each other. And that uh, Anais's presentation and her talk reminded me of that.
。あ、奥野先生、ありがとうございます。そうやってね、そうですね、その。Well, thank you very much,、uh, Okuno Sensei. So, don't, instead of treating science as something distinct or separate, but we are already involved in science, and from that point of view, we consider、um, animism. And based on his experience in field work and the, the analysis attempt to、uh, uh, mix science and art and animism, and they were all merged together in this session, and the session became really interesting. But we would like to、um, end our session now. So thank you very much, Okno Sensei and Anai san. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is all for, the, for this session. So I'll pass it on to Yasan. So thank you very much, Okno Sensei and、um, So, from the very first session, it was really、um, meaningful and meaty. And some of us may be feeling overwhelmed, but、um, the animism is something set in motion and dynamic. And also, Anais's、uh, proposal of listening to plants, how we relate to、uh, non humans. The,、um, the animism can give us a hint to how we relate to non human beings. So, we would like to、uh, take a brief. Break maybe for three minutes and then in Japanese time, we'll start the next session at 7 53. And in European time,、um, 11 53 a.m. So please take a break, refresh, and come back to the session.